So for the next two lectures, this one and the next one, we're going to be talking about counting. Um, and so counting is going to provide some of the first um, kind of real concrete examples of, of how to calculate probability. Um, so we've kind of learned the basic axiomatic rules, we've learned some of the basic theorems, and now we're going to look at some of the first kind of applications of what sample spaces are, probabilities we want to calculate, uh, and using the rules. Um, that we've kind of developed in previous lectures. And in particular, counting gives us um, a nice setting to talk about sample spaces with equally likely outcomes. Um, so let's write this down. Let's say equally likely outcomes. And so the simplest in many ways, the kind of sample space is a sample space where the probability of each outcome in the sample space is equally likely. So if I have a sample space, so I have a sample space, uh, let's say capital S, and capital S is going to be full of um, a finite number of elements, S1, S2, all the way up to, let's say, some S sub n. And assume that the probability of any outcome, say the probability of some event containing just one of these S's. So when I say the probability of an outcome, really we talk about probabilities of events. But if my event is just the set containing one outcome, you know, you can kind of interchangeably call it the probability of an outcome. It's a little bit abusive language, but that's kind of what we're about here in probability. So if we have equally likely outcomes, then the probability of an event containing just one outcome is going to be the same as the probability um, of another event containing some other outcome. And this is for all i and j. So these are equally likely uh, outcomes, as we said, um, because the probability function we're going to build is going to assign equally equal probabilities to any kind of event containing, any kind of simple event containing just that one outcome. Furthermore, we can say that both of these have to be just one over n, that is one over the number of things in my set, that the probability of any set containing, or any event containing just one outcome is just going to be one over n, um, and the rationale for that follows pretty straightforwardly from our um, axioms of probability. So we know that the probability of the whole sample space S better be 1. That follows from um, what was our second axiom, which was the axiom of unit measure. And furthermore, we know that we can write S as the union of little s1, the event containing just little s1, the event containing little, just little s2, dot, 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 up to the union of the event containing just little sn. These are all of these events are disjoint, or we could say that they partition s. And so from our third axiom, we know that the probability of s, which is 1, better be the sum, say i goes 1 to n, of the probabilities of each of these s sub i's. And this is just using our um, third axiom of countable, or in this case, finite additivity. And um, if each of our, our uh, outcomes are equally likely, so if all of these p sub s sub i are all the same, let's say each is equal to some unknown p, some unknown probability value, in the unit interval, 0 to 1, then we have 1 is equal to the sum, i goes 1 to n, of just whatever the value is. And of course, this is n times p. And this implies that p is 1 over n, so that the probability of any of these um, outcomes is 1 over n. I think people believe that. Um, and uh, this probability measure that we've developed here, this equally likely probability measure, we actually proved last time from our kind of finite sample space theorem that this is um, 
is going to be a valid probability measure. Why? Because um, it follows from that theorem. It, it, it satisfies the condition of that theorem, and therefore it's valid. I, I think that's not a controversial point here. And so in this case, we, we say all the outcomes are kind of equally likely. Now, if we wanted to calculate the probability of n, just any um, event can, containing just one outcome, we know it's just one over n, the more general fact, coming kind of from our finite sample space theorem, is that if I have some event E, subset of my sample space, then the probability of this event E is simply going to be the fraction of the number of items or let's say outcomes more specifically, outcomes in E divided by the number of outcomes in S. <clears throat> and this follows from, from our finite sample space theorem and the fact that the probability of each of these is one over um, the number of things in S, right? So N, um, note here that n is equal to the number of things in s. This fraction here is just the cardinality of e over the cardinality of s. And so this probability of any individual outcome, whoops, is 1 over the cardinality of s. And so we can just add up 1 of the cardinality of s. How many times do we add up? Well, we add up the number of times of uh, as the number of outcomes in e. So an, again, a, a kind of we're going through this very formally because that's what the course is about. An a, 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 you know, outcome or a, um, uh, uh, a theorem that is not particularly controversial, I think people will believe this, is that if I have equally likely outcomes, then if I want to calculate the probability of an event, I just need to count the number of things in, in the event, that is, I need the cardinality of E, and I divide by the divide through by the total number of possibilities. It's basically the percentage of all possibilities that occur in E. And that follows, that is not generally true, but that follows because, as, as we said, we're talking about an equally likely um, outcome sample space. So there are many, many kind of simple examples of this. Let's look at some, some simple examples. Example, I roll a six-sided let's say, fair die. So in this case, my sample space is what? Well, it, the easiest way to represent it is any number one to six, any of the six sides of my die. And if, now I have to assume or model, you know, the, there's an assumption going into this is that if the thing is fair, that is, if all outcomes are equally likely, then let's say if E is the event that I get a 2 or a 6, so it's the set containing 2 and 6, then I can calculate the probability. Let's write that legibly for you. Probability of E, that is the probability of getting a 2 or a 6, will be number of things in E over the number of things in S. That is two things in E, six things in S, or a third. Yeah, which makes sense. Again, I think people have some intuition in rolling a die like that. So a, a comment I'll make here is that this is all predicated on the fact that the outcomes are equally likely. So in a homework problem and a test problem, um, typically, you would either be given that information or it would be obvious that that's true. In reality, when you kind of apply probability to solve a problem, that's a modeling decision that needs to be made. It might be a good modeling decision, it might be a bad one. Maybe the die is not exactly fair. Is it a good enough approximation that's fair? Um, and the, so the governing principle here is that that it should be a reasonable assumption that the outcomes are kind of equally likely. And the homework problems you have to think about 
is it reasonable in this problem that the outcomes are equally likely? And uh, the test problem. Sometimes they'll give it to you very explicitly. Sometimes it should be kind of knowable from con from context to you. Okay, so I said the lecture is going to be about counting, and so I've started talking about equally likely sample spaces. What's the connection? Well, the connection is that I can note if I have a sample space with equally likely outcomes, and I want to calculate the probability of some event E. I need the cardinality of E over the cardinality of S. So I need to count, I have two E's in need, need to count the number of items, or let's call them outcomes, in E. And similarly, I need to count number of outcomes in S. So I'm going to need to do some counting. Now, in a very simple example, like rolling a fair die, uh, not very hard, but we're going to come up with kind of more complicated examples, and the more interesting examples are going to uh, require more complicated um, counting techniques to actually figure out okay, how many total possibilities do I have and how many possibilities happen in E. Then I can just take a ratio and I get my probability, assuming that everything's equally likely in the sample space. Okay, so let's talk about counting. We're going to spend about two lectures on counting. It's, it's, it's not necessarily the easiest topic, even though it goes first. Um, it, it, many probability classes spend a long time on counting. Um, I don't think it's, um, it is definitely a nice example of, of um, some simple applications of probability. But at the end of the day, this is not a counting class. It's a probability class, and there are other rules and important concepts that we need to cover. And, and so we're going to spend at most two lectures on this um, before we move on to the more um, uh, important kind of specific uh, topics uh, for probability. Okay. So the first thing we want to talk about is the fundamental theorem of counting. Mathematicians love their fundamental theorems. That's supposed to read theorem. Let's write that more legibly. Theorem. So fundamental theorem counting. We could say FTC. This is not the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is also denoted FTC, but is another kind of fundamental theorem in mathematics. So there's a couple, many ways you can think of counting um, the number of items in a set, for example. And the kind of two ways I'm going to kind of phrase the counting process is either as a job or a task that I'm doing or a series of jobs or tasks you're doing, or some kind of sampling problem where I'm drawing samples out of, out of some population of possibilities. Um, and the second one, the reason I'm going to talk about it in a, in a kind of sampling context is that's very much the kind of way that statisticians talk about it. Really, it's just about counting items in certain ways, but statisticians tend to think about drawing items out of um, some population. And so that's the way that it's typically phrased in a prob probability course, even though it's really just counting, um, counting different collections of things. Okay, so the fundamental theorem of, of counting says that if, um, say, if a counting task, so here I'm, I'm thinking of a task where I'm going to go through and systematically count the number of items in my collection. And if I, this counting task consists of, let's say, k subtasks, and each subtask um, can be done in, let's say, n sub i, um, let me rephrase this, and the ith 
subtask, so i goes 1 to k, the i subtask can be done in n sub i possible ways. Then overall, the number of ways to do the task, I guess I don't really need to call it counting task, we can just say a task or a job, let's say. The number of ways to do the task in total, combining all the sub-steps or the sub-tasks here, um, <coughs> is, let's call it capital N, it's number of ways to do the first subtask times the number of ways to do the second subtask times the number of ways to do the third subtask times the number of ways to do the fourth, etc., etc., all the way up to the last, the kth subtask. So we could write this out a little um, more briefly as is the product. So capital pi is product. I goes 1 to, whoops, k of n sub i. So I'm thinking of doing some task. It has, in order to complete the task, I must complete a series of subtasks. Each of these subtasks can be done in some number of ways. Let's say the ith one can be done in n sub i ways. Then the overall way to do the kind of overall task, which consists of completing the k subtasks, the number of ways to do that is, is going to be the product of the number of ways um, to do each of the subtasks. Okay, let's talk about this more concretely with an example. Which I think will make it much more clear. Okay, example. Um, I'm going to say that I have an experiment. Um, that consists of three factors. Um, and these three factors are factors that I must set for my experiment. The first factor is two temperature settings. Uh, that I can choose from. There are also two pressure settings. That I can choose. Um, and I have one of four humidity settings. So maybe this is like a fluidics experiment. And so I need to do this experiment, and I'm going to set up my experiment, but I can do it in a couple different ways. I have two different ways I can set my temperature, two different ways I can set my pressure, and four different ways I could choose my humidity settings. And so the question, for example, on homework might be how many ways can I run the experiment? So take a minute and think about, you can pause the video and think about what the answer here is. In this case, I have some k is equal to three subtasks. Um, and the number of ways to do the first subtask is two the number of ways to do the second subtask is also two, and the number of ways to do the third subtask is four. So in order to run the experiment, I'm going to have to do each task, which consists of selecting temperature, pressure, or humidity setting. And so overall, I have capital N is equal to two by two by four, um, which should give me what? 16 um, ways to choose my experiment or run the experiment. So this is a pretty simple problem. I'm going to give you kind of a trick that generally can be used um, as a way to visualize these counting tasks. So one way that we can visualize these counting tasks is with um, a tree diagram. So I'm going to start up here at the top. 
I'm gonna have a little node, and I'm gonna say, okay, my first subtask, if I scroll back up here, is to choose my temperature. And I have two ways of choosing that. I can either choose temperature setting one, or I can choose temperature setting two. So I'm gonna branch my tree there. And regardless of how I choose my uh, temperature setting, I then have to choose a pressure setting. And I have two ways of doing that. So if I choose temperature setting P T1, I could choose either pressure setting P1 or pressure setting P2. If I choose temperature setting T2, I could choose, again, pressure setting P1 or pressure setting P2. Okay, so that's the second task completed. And my third task is to choose one of four humidity settings. And so for each, if I choose temperature T1, pressure P1, I have one, two, three, four ways of choosing my humidity. If I choose temperature T1, pressure P2, I also have four ways of choosing my humidity. I could choose temperature T2, pressure P1, I would get four. And similarly, if I choose temperature T2 and pressure P2, I still have four ways. So this is my tree diagram for counting. And Notice that the number of kind of leaf nodes at the end here, the, at the end points here is what? 4, 8, 12, eh, 16. Um, 16 total possibilities. So this is another way of kind of counting the problem in a visual way is to see that, ah, if I draw this diagram, the number of things, and I've got leaf nodes at the end of my tree are the num total number of possibilities. Now, this is a really nice visualization. For a simple problem, it's kind of overkill. But it this counting, this tree diagram, uh, works for any counting problem. Now, it could be very cumbersome to draw, but I could have very complicated uh, uh choices where the, the, the pressure settings depend on the previous temperature settings and the humidity settings you know, depend on the previous pressure and temperature settings. So maybe not all these possibilities could happen and some of them can. Maybe you have different number of branches at each point. But you can always draw the tree out. And at the end, you, the number of leaf nodes is always going to be the correct number of, of things. So if you get to a really hard problem that you, you you know, you want to think through what's going on, it's almost always useful to kind of draw out a tree like this, um, where each level of the tree here is a different task. So task one, task two, task three. Um, and this works for simple problems, but it will work for any counting problem, no matter how complicated. Okay. So another real simple example of this fundamental theorem of uh, counting here, let's say example, um, a man has five shirts, two pairs of pants, and two pairs of shoes. And the uh, question here is how many outfits, maybe not good looking outfits, but how many, that's supposed to be a Y, many outfits does the man have uh, having trouble writing today how many outfits does the man have and so again you can break it into three sub tasks five choose your shirt five different ways choose your pants two different ways and choose your shoes two different ways and so we know from up from the fundamental theorem of counting that there are five by two by two, uh, which is what, 20 different outfits. Um, and uh, you can think about how you could draw out this little diagram, the kind of tree diagram, but I think this problem is simple enough that people will believe me. Okay. So these are just examples of how to do some counting. We could look at how this applies to probability. So 
example, I have a deck of 52 cards. So card games are always kind of a favorite in probability classes. I have a deck of 52 cards. Uh, so 52 cards come in one of 13 denominations, ace through king, um, ace through jack, 10 through, uh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, so the 52 cards, let me just describe this, ace through king, ace low, that's fine, two, three, etc. cetera, jack, I guess it goes up to a 10, jack, Queen, king, so that's king high, ace low, and um, so these are called um, denominations. That's not legible. Let's try this again. Denominations. So there are 13 denominations, and there are suits, which um, are either clubs, diamonds, hearts, or spades. So there are four different suits. Okay. 52, and um, if I shuffle them, so I shuffle them, um, so that each ordering of the cards is equally likely. And I can ask, say, what is the probability that I get the, um, that after I do the shuffle, I get the um, cards, quote, in order. And by in order, I mean they are going to be ace through king, Clubs, diamonds, hearts, spades. So ace to the king of clubs, ace through king of heart, diamonds, hearts, and then spades. Doesn't particularly matter what order, but you get just gotta pick one of them, right? So I have this deck of cards, shuffle them, and what's the probability that after the shuffle, they come back in exactly the, the correct uh, ace through king, clubs, diamonds, hearts, spades order? Okay, so here's a real probability problem. This feel, kind of feels like a real probability problem. Um, so if I assume, which I've kind of told you in the problem, that each ordering of the cards is equally likely, then if I want to calculate the probability, I could let E kind of be the event um, that I get the cards in order, and I could let my sample space be all possible orderings of the 52 cards and if I did that and the elements of S are all equally likely then the probability of my event E is just the number of things in E over the number of things in S. And of course there is only one possible ordering and so the cardinality of E is 1. E, there's one possible ordering where they're in order. That's, you know, I guess ace through king of clubs, ace through king of diamonds, etc. But the question is, how many possible orderings do I have of my 52 cards? So what started off as a probability problem now, again, as we've said, is just going to reduce down to a counting problem. I need to count the number of things in my... Um, in my sample space, S. So we can do this counting with the fundamental theorem. So I'm going to say that there are k equal to 52 subtasks um, uh, for to create an ordering of the cards. So if I want to come up with all possible orderings, I kind of have to enumerate the orderings of the cards. 
And so if I were to enumerate the orders of the cards, I could do that through a 52 subtask process. The first task would be to, so let's say task one, I would choose what is going to be the first card in my ordering. Task two would be to choose card two. Task three would be to choose card three. And I could just continue. And at the end of the day, I will get down to task um, 52, which is to choose card 52. Now, these choices are not kind of independent of each other. If I choose a card to be earlier, it can't be later. If I want to apply my fundamental theorem, I just need to count for each of these, these tasks. Task 1, how many ways can I do task 1, task 2, task 3, etc., all the way up to task 52, and I'll get some numbers, and then they're going to multiply them. And this is just a, a really long version of um, application of the fundamental theorem of counting. So how many ways can I do task one? How many ways can I choose the first card? Well, the first card is kind of, I can choose whatever I want. It's the first card in my ordering, right? So I have, of 52 cards, I have 52 choices. Now, task two, I'm going to choose my second card. But I don't have 52 choices because I've already put one card as the first and I can't repeat a card. So I'm only going to have 51 left. There's 51 cards that I haven't put in my ordering yet. So I can choose any of those. The third one, there are two cards already in there. I can't choose those cards again. So I'm going to choose from my remaining uh, 50 cards. So there are 50 ways to choose my third one. And so forth and so forth. When I get to my last card, my 52nd card, I'll have put 51 of them in the pile. And those will be one card left. I'm forced. I have to choose that last one in a specific way. So I have one way to choose my 52nd card. So... If, when I apply the fundamental theorem of counting, the cardinality of S, which is going to be just the multiplication of these, is going to be 52 by 51 by 50 by 49, dot, 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 all the way by 3 by 2 by 1. And so that is going to be how many ways I can form these orderings, and therefore how, how many uh, orderings I have, the cardinality of S. And hence, we said up here that the probability of getting the cards in order, probability of E, is just 1 over the cardinality of S. And so that's going to be 1 over 52 by 51 by 50, dot, 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 3 by 2 by 1. Right? You can actually calculate that, um, say, ask Google what that is. It's something on the order of 10 to the negative 68. So don't bet on that. That's not a winning thing to do. And as we know, you know, I've shuffled a lot of cards in my life. I've never seen them come back in perfect order. It's a very, very small probability. So that's a nice uh, probability example. It also leads us to the definition of a very useful concept called factorial, which probably you've seen before. So... Uh, a factorial for any, um, let's say, non-negative integer n, we define what we call n factorial, um, denoted n with an exclamation point after it as n factorial and exclamation is just the products of the numbers 1 to n. So it's typically we write it in reverse order. It's n by n minus 1 by n minus 2 dot 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 by 3 by 2 by 1. Right. So it's the product of the numbers 1 to n. You can write it in product notation. Pi for product. I goes 1 to n. Um, product of i. A note here, I said any non-negative integer, is that 0 factorial is defined, whoops, that's not right, 0, is defined to be 1. 
So, uh, and that's a very, very useful definition for counting. So, and somewhat of a kind of choice, but it's a reasonable choice, uh, which is it. One factorial will be one. It's just the product of one by nothing. Zero factorial kind of doesn't fall into the formula as is described here, but it's typically taken as one. And we will definitely use that in this course. So in our example above, um, uh, previous example, we could have more simply written that the probability of E, which is getting our cards in order after shuffling them, is 1 over 52 factorial. Okay. So that's uh, kind of our fundamental theorem of counting, some examples. So the rest of this lecture and the next lecture, we're going to look at a couple different scenarios for counting. And I'm going to typically talk about these counting scenarios as if we're kind of sampling from some population. And that's kind of a quirk of me being a statistician. Um, and we think of things being having some population of possibilities and we draw samples from it. And um, it's ways, it's, that's just language that's used to talk about counting um, ways of making uh, collections of things. Um, and so we're going to talk about sampling with or without ordering and replacement. Okay, so let's talk about what that means. So let's first talk about ordering. We want to distinguish between collections of things where the order matters um, or not. The order of our collection of things doesn't matter. So again, I think about this in terms of sampling. Um, so um, let's say, uh, do I care about the order of my sample that I draw. So for example, I have a basket maybe, and it has three balls in it, balls one, two, and three. And I'm gonna sample, I'm gonna draw the balls out in succession. And one way I could draw them is I could draw ball one, then ball three, and ball two. Or another way I could draw them is I could draw ball two first, then ball one, then ball three. So if I care about the order in which I draw them, then these are distinct samples. If I don't care about the order in which I draw them, then they're kind of the same. I've drawn one, two, and three, and one, two, and three. Did it in a different order, but maybe I care about them the problem. Maybe I don't. The second thing um, that we consider when we uh, take samples is um, replacement. And um, the question here, um, let's say, uh, can I draw the same Oops, the same item twice. Or let's say more than once. Maybe I could draw it three times. So here is my example. Again, I have a basket. Um, so for ordering, I could say those different. In this case, I have my basket. Again, I have ball one, ball two, and ball three. And one scheme of sampling from this basket is that, um, let's say replacement, is that after, um, so let's say with replacement, after I draw each ball, I put it back. So possible 
it to draw. Maybe I could first draw one. So I take it out of the basket. I write it down, but then I put it back in the basket. I could then go back and I could draw a ball again. So I still have three balls in my basket. But it's possible I get ball one again. I write it down, put it in my basket, and maybe then the third time I ball, draw, draw ball three. So it's possible I get ball one, ball one, ball two. So I sample it with replacement, where after each sample, I put the item back, mix it up again. So it's possible that I can get the same item more than once. Without replacement, I, as you might suspect, I don't replace it. So not possible. Um, It would not be possible to draw one one two because after i draw one out of the basket i don't put it back so i draw one out but now only two and three are left in there so it's pot impossible to first draw one and on the second time draw one because on the second if i drew on the first time it's not allowed on the second one so pretty straightforward so the kind of two major kind of differences in schemes for sampling is do I care about replacement and do I care about ordering? So this gives us um, four scenarios. I can sample without replacement. I can sample with replacement. That's kind of one axis of possibilities. And the other one is I can sample in an ordered fashion, or I can sample in an unordered fashion. So when you drawing samples from, say, some finite population of possibilities, you kind of have to consider for the problem, OK, do I care about the order of my sample? And when I'm drawing, do I replace them each time, or do I not? So this gives us kind of four major um, modes of counting. Um, you know, I talk about this in terms of sampling, but it's really kind of kind of samp kind of constructing or counting things. It's ultimately it's going to be used for is counting things where either I care about the order of the things I'm counting, I don't care about the order of the things I'm counting, um, and I can have repeats in the things I'm counting, or I can't have repeats. So it's kind of replacement and not replacement. And it's just different language. So we're going to go through these. First, we're going to look at ordered counting. And so we're going to look at ordered with replacement. And then we're going to look at ordered without replacement. Oh, I'm sorry, we're going to look at ordered without replacement first. Then we're going to look at ordered with replacement. That will, that will kind of go through today's lecture. In the next lecture, we are going to consider unordered counting. And we are going to look at counting um, in uh, unordered sampling scheme. Uh, with replacement or without replacement. Okay, so let's consider our first um, scenario we want to consider is sampling um, where we care about the ordering. So today is going to be ordered sampling. So at the way beginning of this lecture, I wrote way back up, let's see, wee, all the way back up that we're talking about ordered counting today. Here we go. We finally got to the fact, to the, to the kind of punchline here. We're going to talk about how to count ordered samples or ordered uh, collections of things. So the first thing I think we should talk about is we should talk about what a permutation is. Um, so permutation, and a permutation is kind of a fancy way of saying an ordering of a collection of objects. So a permutation is uh, an ordering of a uh, collection of objects. So uh, let's say, for example, maybe my objects are uh, the set. I have an object A1, an object A2, and an object A3. And I can permute these, is the verb. I have possible permutations of the objects is if I put them in a particular order. So one particular order is A1, A2, 
a3. But that's not the only order, right? I could put them at a1, a3, a2. Or I could do a2, a1, a3. Let's think. What are the other ones? I could say a2, a3, a1. And of course, I could say a3, a1, a2, or a3, a2, a1. And I'm going to claim that these are all the possible permutations of these three items, a1, a2, and a3. So there are six possibilities of permutations. And where did I get six from? How do I know that? Well, I have three items here, and I'm going to order these items in some way. And six is exactly three factorial. And that's the theorem. So the theorem is if I want to count a permutation, Let's say, so I'm going to say it's called theorem about permutation counting. The number of ways to permute n items is n factorial. So in this example, I have three items. I will have three factorial, three by two by one. That's six ways of making permutations, that is ordering these three items. Excellent. Okay. Proof. Why is that true? Well, what do we know about counting so far? Not a hell of a lot. What other theorems do we have? Well, we have the fundamental theorem of counting. Let's use the FTC to prove this. So if I want to choose an ordering of things, this is very much like ordering my cards. Hmm. In fact, those shuffles of the cards are permutations of the 52 cards. So if I want to come up with a permutation of the items, I will have uh, k equal to n subtasks. That is the first task. So let's say task um, and... Uh, Task number one, the task is choose the first item in my permutation, and the number of ways to do this, well, I have, n, just like my, my card counting problem, I have n items, and so I can choose any of the n items to be my first uh, first item in my order and first item in my permutation. My second task, task two, is to choose item two. Now I can't choose the whatever I chose in the first task. That's not allowed. But I can choose any of the remaining n minus one of those items. And so I have n minus one ways to do that. My third task, to choose the third item in my permutation. I can choose any of the remaining uh, n minus 2 items. And I'm going to end up with n tasks. And my nth task is to choose the nth item. And I will have one way of doing that. And just like my card counting problem, I multiply these using the fundamental theorem of counting. I multiply the number of ways to do each of the subtasks. And that gives me A total number of ways to do the entire overall task. Uh, let's say number of ways um, n by n minus 1 by n minus 2 dot 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 by 1. That is n factorial ways. So it's just basically the, that card count problem and then the fundamental theorem of counting. Okay. Permutation counting. So what does that have to do with counting ordered things? Well, let's write the theorem. The theorem has a lot to do with ordering things, right? So we don't talk about ordered counting, so we talk about permutations, which is how to order things and how many ways can we order things. Theorem 
So this is ordered sampling that you're talking about today without replacement. Okay. What does the theorem says, say? The theorem says that if I have n items and from which I can draw a sample, I draw a sample of size r and items. I'm going to draw r of them out as a sample. So here, r better be less than or equal to n. Otherwise, we get a problem. n items, sample of size r, and I draw my sample without replacement and I care about the order of my draws. So I care about the order in which I draw the things and so not replacing them after I draw them. And the theorem says I can do this. That is, there are how many possible samples? I can draw or do this sampling procedure in n uh, how many ways? So our notation, well, let's write it. The number of ways we can do this is n factorial, which would be an exclamation mark, n factorial over n minus r factorial. So the number of ways I can do this, another way of saying that is the number of possible samples I can draw is, and our notation for this sometimes is used n with parens around it and a subscript r. But that's just notation. The important thing to remember is that it's n factorial write that a little more legibly here, n factorial over n minus r factorial. Okay, so again, let's just absorb what this says. n items, I'm going to draw r of them into a sample. I'm going to not replace them after each one I draw, and I care about the order in which I draw them. How many ways, can, how many different samples can I draw? I can draw n factorial over n minus r factorial. That's what the theorem says. So this is the number, the way to count collections of things where I care about the order, but they can't repeat. That's another way of thinking about this. I talk about it in terms of sampling, but if you could say instead of replacement, you say items can't repeat, and I care about the order of the items in my sample. Okay. Can we prove this? Again, th this proof is just going to basically use the fundamental theorem of counting. So you can think about how you go about and prove this. Um, not so bad. Um, so in this case, I have how many subtasks? Well, I have k is equal to r subtasks. And I'm, uh, let's draw our little table here. So task number, what my task actually is, and the number of ways to do the task. Okay. Nice little table. Task number one, my task is to draw the first item from my basket. So I have n possible items I can draw from it. I'm going to draw r of them. How many ways can I, how many ways can I get that first one? I can get it in n possible ways because there are n of them. Second task, I've drawn the first one. I now have n minus one things in my basket. And I'm going to draw the second. And I have n minus 1 possibilities left in my basket I can draw from. Third task is to draw the third. I have n minus 2 left. And you can see the pattern here. It's much like the previous problem we've done, but now I only have r less than or equal to n subtask. So when I draw the rth, I will have how many ways of doing that? I, well, I draw the first, I have n. 
second is n minus 1, third is n minus 2, the rth is going to be n minus r plus 1. Why do I have the plus 1? Well, right, 1 corresponds to n, 2 corresponds to n minus 1, so n minus 2 plus 1. 3 corresponds to n minus 2, n minus 3 plus 1, so r would correspond to n minus r plus 1. And, of course, I'm going to multiply. So I multiply. Oops, that's supposed to read multiply. Say I multiply these. And so I get a total number of ways to kind of a, a sample in this way as n by n minus 1 by n minus 2 all the way down to n minus r plus 1. But that, so that's true. That's not what I wrote, though. What I wrote was n factorial over n minus r factorial. But let's make the argument that these are the same, that, that it actually is this here. So let's look at n factorial over n minus r factorial. Now, here's a little trick for calculating factorials. So I can always expand out. n factorial is n by n minus 1, dot, dot, dot. It goes all the way down to n minus r plus 2, n minus r plus 1, um, n minus r, dot, 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 by 3, by 2, by 1. So I'm just going to kind of expand out that section there. <clears throat> n minus r factorial starts at n minus r, so it goes n minus r times n minus r minus 1 times n minus r minus 2, dot, 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 all the way down one. So that's n factorial over n minus r factorial. I can cancel a bunch of stuff. One cancels one, two, and two, three, and three. And all of these cancel all the way up to n minus r. So I'll cancel a bunch of stuff here all the way up to n minus r. And what I'll just be left over with is exactly what I had written above, which is n by n minus one dot 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 all the way to n minus r plus one. So the succinct way, kind of fancy way people write it, is n factorial over n minus r factorial. It can be helpful in calculating, but it doesn't really matter which way you remember it. But that's the answer, and that's the theorem, which is if I want to draw n items or r items from n, care about the ordering not doing replacement, I can do that n factorial over n minus r factorial ways. Okay, let's look at some examples. Example. Uh, so I have 10 students, and they want to, to form a committee um, consisting of three members, uh, the president, vice president, and the treasurer. How many possible different committees can I form? So I have 10 students. I want to form a committee. I'm going to choose one of them to be president, one to be VP, one to be treasurer. How many possible committees can I form? I'm going to argue that you can solve this problem by thinking about forming the three-member committee as choose you have n equals 10 possible people to choose from. You're going to choose a sample r is equal to 3, and you're not going to replace um, no replacement. I could even write in this problem um, that these guys must be distinct. So no replacement, and I care about the ordering. Why do I care about the ordering? What I'm going to say is that the first person I choose is the president, the second person I choose is the vice president, and the third person I choose is the treasurer, which is just a convenient way of assigning them, right? 
but the president is you can't the fundamental fact is I, I have an order to them i can't the president doesn't do the same thing as the vice president doesn't do the same thing as the treasurer right so the the order of the or the kind of positions matter um and saying they must be distinct is basically saying that i cannot have sample with replacement so if i do that then then the problem is pretty easy because i have a formula uh, the number of ways i can do this i can form a committee here is n factorial over n minus r factorial which is 10 factorial over 10 minus 3 factorial so that's 10 factorial over 7 factorial so a little trick I'll show you with these factorials is that 10 factorial is a huge number. I don't want to plug that directly into my calculator. I can expand it out as 10 by 9 by 8 by 7 factorial. That's true. And then I'm dividing by 7 factorial. And so I can cancel those. And I'm left over with 10 by 9 by 8, which should give me 720. Total possible. Um, possible committees I can form. Cool. Let's look at another example. Uh, let's say lottery, the lotto. So I have a box with, uh, let's say ping pong boxes, uh, balls. I have a box, ping pong balls, numbered 1 to 25. So I have some box, and I have a bunch of ping pong balls, 2, 3, all the way up to 25. And the lotto, uh, my lottery, draws four balls, um, and uh, if, if you guess the four in correct order, you win. All right, it's a classic and a lot of thing. So here's my choice, my choice. I'm gonna play this lotto and I'm gonna say it's gonna come out one, three, 22, seven. It doesn't particularly matter the order, but um, matters that I choose a particular order here. So the question, of course, is what I really want to know is what is the probability that I win? So let's stipulate here that all, um, uh, all possibilities all drawings, all samples from these 25 are equally likely. And in that case, I can say the event that I win, E, is that it comes up 1, 3, 22, 7. So that's kind of the event I win. And uh, the sample space, or let's say the sample space, is all possible drawings. So this is another problem. So, okay, so if everything's equally likely, let's back up here and say that probability of winning is, of course, the number of things in E over the number of things in S. One way of winning, which is that it comes up exactly 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 7. And then I need to figure out how many possible ways that we can get these different drawings. So, I'm stipulating that you can't, you don't draw the same ball twice. So let's say draw without replacement. And uh, I care about the ordering because you have to get them in the correct order. So this is a problem without replacement. This is basically a sampling without replacement. And I care about ordering. And so our theorem says that the number of ways I can basically sample four balls so here n is, we have 25, we're gonna take a sample of four. We don't care about ordering, or we care about ordering, we don't care, we don't replace. Then my theorem says this is n factorial over n minus r factorial, 25 factorial over 25 minus four.
Toriel. Um, and uh, so what's that? It's 25 times 24 times 20. Uh, three, well, times 22 times 21 factorial over 21 factorial. 21 factorials cancel. So I get 25 times 24 times 23 times 22. So that's the size of S here. And so one over that, the probability that I win in this lotto is one over 20, uh, 25 by 24 by 23 by 22. That's really, really small. So brownie face, sad. Don't play the lotto. Uh, that is uh, not really easy to win. It's a really small number. Okay. So that's ordering where we're talking, uh, where we care about the sampling, where we care about the ordering, and we don't replace things. Of course, we could um, talk about sampling where we care about the ordering, but we do replace things after each uh, each draw from our sample. So let's talk about that other spot. So real quick, we go back up to our little table. We can start filling in our table here. We fill in our table. Uh, one, the number of ways to do this is n by over n minus r factorial. Okay, so we have our first box filled in. Now let's fill in our second box where Instead of talking about without replacement, now we talk about with replacement. Okay, all the way back down. So theorem, so this is sampling uh, with replacement. So at each time I draw something, I then record it and I put it back and mix it around. So it's the same, at each draw we have the same number of things from which we're drawing and uh, with ordering. That is, I care about my ordering. <clears throat> so the number of ways to draw a sample of size r from a total size of n items number of things my sample is r, I'm drawing that from some population of n items. And we're going to say with replacement and to without ordering. Number of ways to draw that sample is n to the r. Period. That's a much more succinct way of writing a theorem. So my claim is that if I want to draw R items from N, I care about the order in which I draw them, but I, uh, I'm going to replace them after each sample I draw. I can do that in N to the R ways. Notice here that we don't need R less than or equal to N. In the previous theorem, we needed r less than or equal to n. In this case, you can have, since we replace it after each um, uh, draw out of our sample, we do it with replacement, we can have, we can draw a sample of things, of more things than we have in our population because we're not changing the number of things from which we draw at each point. Okay, let's look at the proof. I bet you can guess how this is proved. Use FT. C. So that's why that theorem is called the fundamental theorem of accounting is because it is super fundamental and everything else is kind of derived from that. So in order to use the fundamental theorem of counting, right, we have to break up into a, this task of the sampling task into a series of subtasks. So we have task number, we have description, and then let's say the number of ways to do that task. We need to, again, we have R subtasks. Each of our subtasks is going to be choosing uh, one item for our sample. So our first task here is the select the first item for my sample. 
And how many ways can I do that, right? Um, well, I have n items, and I can choose any of them to be the first item in my sample. I care about the ordering, so I care that it's the first. So there are n ways of doing that. Okay, so I take that one of the items I, uh, from my basket, one of the n items, I look at it, I record on this, but now, unlike previously, I put it back. So my, my basket, with, with all possible things I can draw from, has still has n items in it. So when I go to do my second task, to select my second item, I still have n things in my basket because I replaced things. So I still have n ways to do the second thing. And when I, so I take the thing I, for the second item, I look at it, I record it, I put it back, still have n things in my basket, go to my third task. I'm gonna select the third and there are still n today. It doesn't change when I replace things. And so you can see the pattern here. I'm gonna have R task where I select uh, the last one is like the rth item, and each of my subtasks has n possibilities. So when I take these and I multiply uh, the total number of ways is equal to n times n times n times n, n times n times n. I'm going to multiply this r times, which of course our notation is n to the r. Cool. So that's real simple proof. It's actually simpler than the other proof. So when I'm sampling with ordering, but without, uh, with ordering and replacement, it's just n to the r. So let's look at kind of closing out uh, this lecture with uh, an example. And uh, let's say example um, so <clears throat> there's so-called, if you're not familiar with this, which some people aren't, there's a so-called Braille, uh, uh, alphabet, let's say, right? So Google that if you're not familiar, it's for, uh, if you're visually impaired and you, um, it's kind of raised bumps on a page that kind of allow you to read. So typically these raised bumps, there are six spots. You can put these raised bumps here, right? So six locations for bumps in a Braille letter, let's say. So each, you have these six possibilities and they can, some of these possibilities you'll have a little raised bump and maybe this is my my possibility of raised bumps. So I have these three raised bumps, the other spots are kind of flat. So when you run your finger over it, you can, you can feel which ones are raised and therefore you can identify a letter. Okay, so six locations for raised bumps and a braille letter. The question is, is six enough? How many, um, how many braille letters can I make? So I claim that this is a counting problem where I'm sampling with replacement uh, and, but I care about the order. So here's the idea to how to kind of convert this into the counting problem or the sampling problem. I'm gonna draw six samples corresponding to my possible bumps on the page from two possibilities. So my kind of collection of things from which I can draw is two possibilities, either raised, either the bump exists, or let's say not raised. So this is gonna be sampling with replacement and without ordering. And I number of things, possibilities is two, but I'm gonna draw six. Notice that six is bigger than two. I only have two possibilities, there's raised, there's not, but I'm gonna draw it for six different locations. And so the total number of ways 
to do this, which corresponds to the total number of braille letters I can make, is going to be 2 to the 6, which is 64. You could argue it's 63 if um, you want to say that having no raised bumps doesn't count because then you can't tell if there's a space or not. So typically, I think actually there's only 63 possibilities, but for our purposes, you could have all of them not raised, um, and that would be 64 total possibilities. So that's an example of, of counting uh, where I do replace and um, I uh, care about the ordering. So this counting stuff has a it is is super fun. It has a um, a couple different ways of interpreting it. I tend to talk about it as um, sampling, but you could so sampling with ordering or without replace with or without replacement. You could also talk about it as um, enumerating sets where I care about the order of uh, enumerating you know collection of things where I care about the ordering of the collection of things and I can have repeat items or not. So it's kind of replacement or not. It's the same kind of thing. Um, and this is kind of a really nice introductory probability concept. And so you typically see it in the probability class because if I have equally likely um, outcomes in my sample space, which is kind of one of the simplest probability functions we can assign for a sample space, then if I want to calculate the probability event, I just have to calculate how many things are in my sample space and how many things are in my event, or how many outcomes are in my event, and take the ratio of one. And we've seen a couple of examples. Okay, so, so next time we will finish up with counting. We're just going to do two lectures on it, not overboard. And we're going to talk about um, counting uh, where uh, we do not care about the ordering. Um, and uh, it's a little more complicated. And then I'll end off that lecture um, by making some kind of general comments on, on counting um, and uh, how, um, how it is used kind of an application in probabilities problems and kind of give some tricks and some hints for solving some of the kind of homework and exam problems you'll see.